Today on America's Test Kitchen, Bridget and Elle give deviled pork chops a makeover. Jack challenges Julia to a tasting of dark chocolate chips. Dan uncovers the secret of non-Newtonian fluids. And Lon makes Julia the ultimate thick-cut oven prize. It's all coming up on America's Test Kitchen. The practice of deviling, that is flavoring food with mustard, pepper, and sometimes vinegar, it dates back to before the 18th century. Now, back in the 1950s, it really came into its stride and everything was deviled. You had deviled eggs, you had deviled ham, and even deviled pork chops. I've eaten a few of those and they're not really that good. But we've got someone here who's gonna solve all of our deviling problems. It's our angel, Elle. And she's going to show us how to make the perfect deviled pork chops. Well, this recipe is a throwback classic, and it's one of my favorites. So there are three components to this dish, and the first is going to be the crust. Okay. Okay? We're starting with half a cup of panko because it has a nice craggy texture. So I'm going to brown the panko in two tablespoons of unsalted butter for about three to five minutes over medium heat. Well, that makes sense. You're not starting off with just raw breadcrumbs and hoping that they get crisp in the oven. You're starting off with something that's already crisp. Right. Those look great. It's beautiful. Nice and brown. You can hear the crunch. Super crispy. So I'm just going to transfer it to a bowl. And to it, I'm going to add an eighth teaspoon of salt, just for some flavor. OK. So I'm just going to set that aside for now. All right. So the second component of our dish is our paste, right? So this is the part that makes the breadcrumbs stick. It's the part that actually gives the whole chop it's flavor. It's the deviling and it's the glue. Yep, and guess what? <laughs> this is where the devil's in the details. Ah! <laughs> so our charge here is to create a bold flavor that has a balance between spiciness and acidity. Okay. Right? Okay. Super important here. So I'm going to start with a quarter cup of Dijon mustard. We're starting off pretty intense here. Also two teaspoons of packed brown sugar. One and a half teaspoons of dry mustard. Two kinds of mustard. A half teaspoon of garlic that's been minced into a paste. A quarter teaspoon of cayenne pepper. There's the heat. Oh, yeah. <laughs> One teaspoon each of pepper and salt. You see where we're going here? I do. And I see that you use two different kinds of pepper. You're bringing the Hades to the set here. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. There's levels to this. We have a great combination of spiciness, mm. acidity. So I'm just going to set this aside, and we're going to start working on our chops. Sounds good. OK, Bridget, we have our main component pork chops. Okay. And they're on a wire rack set into a baking sheet that we've sprayed with nonstick cooking spray. Okay. okay? And there's a reason for that. We'll, we'll get there. So I'm just going to pat these dry. It's going to help our mustard paste stick properly. Okay. And these okay. aren't those paper thin pork chops that I've seen done before. These are what, like an inch thick or something? Yep, yep. three quarter to an inch thick. And never use bone in pork chops for double pork chops because that breading coats everything. I've made that mistake once. All right, I'm going to start putting the paste on and you only need about a tablespoon per chop. I'm going to paste them all, and you can brush it on. It's a good idea to yeah. divvy it up first. That way you know that you haven't run out by the time you get to the last one. So I'm going to brush the tops and the sides. And there's no need to brush the bottom, because it'll just stick to the pan, and we want to savor all the flavor. We don't want to waste anything. And all that would just drip down and be gone. And, and bye -bye. be gone. So each chop gets two tablespoons of panko. OK. That's quite a bit, too. Yeah. That's good. You're not skimping on anything. No, this is how we get the crunch factor. <laughs> no skimping here. Uh-uh. And I'm just spreading it out with a tablespoon. You can use your hands if you like. And these are natural pork chops, too, right? Yes. So it's a good idea to use natural here, especially because we're breading them. If you use enhanced pork chops, that's pork chops that have been soaked or injected with a saline solution, well, they can actually start to weep a little bit, and you might get kind of a soggy crust. Plus, natural pork just tastes better. These look amazing, and they're ready for the oven. They're gorgeous. They actually look like they're already cooked. Well, I know that they're not. They're not. <laughs> they're not. And one of the most common mistakes in cooking these devil pork chops is that they get dried out from the broiling method that we use, and they're cooking from the outside in. Right. What we want to do is cook it low and slow at 275 degrees for 40 to 50 minutes so they can cook evenly. So the whole method to me makes so much sense. You pre-brown the breadcrumbs because at yes. 275, they're not really going to brown that much in the oven right. for that length of time. And there was no searing on the stovetop because you're coating it with the beautiful breadcrumbs. Don't need to do it. We don't need to do it. All right. So we're going to cook it 40 to 50 minutes or until the internal temperature is 140 degrees. <sighs> oh, my goodness. Gorgeous. 
I'm so ready to eat these. Look what we did. <laughs> that looks amazing. All right, so I'm just gonna temp these. Going into the center. Make sure it's at 140 degrees. Yeah, we're there. Oh, so good. I know. I know you wanna eat these right away, but we have to let them rest for about 10 minutes. All right, so they'll cool down, but also they're gonna rise in temperature just a little bit. Just right? a little bit. All right. Don't let that little devil on your shoulder tempt you to touch these chops. Yeah, yeah well, get rid of that guy. <laughs> Guess what time it is. I hope it's eating time. It is definitely <laughs> eating time. There's a chop for you. Gorgeous. And you know, a crunchy breadcrumb coating, you know, is sometimes used to hide some mistakes within, but I doubt it with you. It's only one way to find out. Look at that meat, it's so moist and juicy. That is beautiful. It's evenly cooked as well. Oh yeah. I'm going in. You're going in. Yeah. Getting the whole package here. That fiery, spicy balance is there. It is fiery. There's some kick there, but it's also tangy. Mm -hmm. I like that. Mm -hmm. That little bit of sweet from the brown sugar yeah. and that tanginess from the Dijon mustard. It's crunchy. Super crunchy, too. The complexity of the flavor of that paste yeah. is perfection. Thank you for bringing us these amazing devil pork chops. My pleasure. Well, if you want to make these at home, and I'm telling you, you do want to make them at home, it all starts with a great crust. And you start by toasting panko with butter, make a sweet and spicy paste with brown sugar, cayenne, and both Dijon and dry mustard. Coat the tops of one inch pork chops with the paste and crumbs, and then slow roast them until just cooked through. Of course, you have to rest them, but then you get to devour. So from our test kitchen to your kitchen, juicy, crunchy, and a little spicy, like us, deviled pork chops. So good, let's tuck back in. A few years ago, chocolate bars got fancy with cacao percentages and origin stories. And today, chocolate chips are experiencing a very similar renaissance, along with bigger price tags. So Jack's here to tell us if any of these fancy chips are worth it. Yeah, do you want the good news first? Or Always. The good news? Always good news first. These are so much better than the last time we did a taste test in 2009, but on average, the price has doubled. Wow, doubled. Yeah, basically, these are the same quality as now eating chocolates. Oh, that's good news. Yeah, so start eating. All right. We did the taste test the exact way that you were doing it, right from the package. We also baked with the cookies. Can you guess what we made with them? <laughs> Chocolate chip cookies. Yeah. And we found very similar characteristics. The only thing that really changed were there were a couple of brands that uh, were rectangular chunks hmm. that we really love straight from the package, but caused all kinds of problems in the oven blobs, too much chocolate, mm. not enough chocolate, they didn't spread properly. Basically, those big chunks were causing irregularities in the cookies. And so, although we liked the way they tasted, they ended up at the bottom of the rankings. I didn't bring any of those here because you were going to like them, and then I was going <laughs> to tell you the bad news that they didn't bake very well. I appreciate that. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking about you, Julia. <laughs> so, big thing here that you want to be looking for is, first of all, sugar level. Mm -hmm. So, those percentages that are listed on the package, the cacao, basically, the balance is sugar. So if it says 60% cacao, that means it's roughly 40% sugar. There may be a little bit of an emulsifier, lecithin, a little bit of vanilla, but that's you know one, maybe 2% at most, and the balance is going to be sugar. No surprise, we thought that the brands with less sugar had more chocolate flavor. So that's a good thing. Second thing that you want to be thinking about is what is that chocolate flavor? You know, during the processing, mm -hmm. manufacturers can bring out fruity notes, black cherry, mm -hmm. uh, vanilla. Um, sort of, you know, tropical things. Mm -hmm. They can also bring out espresso, mm. smoke, weather. It's almost like wine. It is almost like wine. And people are very serious about chocolate, mm -hmm. all kinds of chocolate, including the chocolate chip. So any impressions of the four samples that are here? Um, this one tastes remarkably familiar to me. And I'm wondering if this isn't what I grew up with, which is Nestle semi-sweet chocolate. So that's my first impression. Okay. This one was very fruity. And you were talking about fruit at the time I was tasting it, so maybe I was influenced, but it reminded me of some really bitter, fruity chocolates that I'm actually not a huge fan of. I appreciate it, but not the biggest fan. So these are delicious. I could just sit here and snack on these all day. So I'm in love with these. These, these are pretty good, I have to say. Their size is kind of the classic size I grew up with, but they have a better flavor than these. So if I were to rate them, 
Okay. I think these. And you are actually, by the way, supposed to rate them. <laughs> <laughs> I would put these as first. These are second. Um, these are good. They're a different style than I like, but I appreciate the quality. And these would be last. Okay. I should say that the differences in size here, these did not impact the cookies. As long as it had the round, classic teardrop shape, it didn't cause any problems with the cookies in terms of distribution of the chocolate. Mm -hmm. So small chip, big chip, it's really personal preference. All right. So let's start with my favorite. So you chose Nestle's oh. newer, more expensive, sort of more upscale product. This is their bittersweet chip. So we probably both grew up on semi-sweet morsels. Mm -hmm. Their sugar content is about 57%. Sugar content here is really closer to about 38%. Oh, wow, much so lower. Much, much lower. And so you get more chocolate flavor. Mm -hmm. They're also a little bigger, which I think has a psychological impact <laughs> that you think, oh, right. more chocolate, it's a bigger chip. <laughs> All right, now let's go with these, which I kind of recognize as having a fancier flavor. They're fancier. I'm surprised you didn't like it. That was the taster's favorite. Ah. So that's from Ghirardelli. Mm -hmm. That is their 60%. Now, they also make a semi-sweet, which we did not like nearly as much. This is actually the exact same formula as our winning bar chocolate. Uh, Ghirardelli, 60%. Bar chocolate is our favorite. We actually called after the tasting. They're like, yeah, they're the exact same thing. We just put them into different molds. Wow, well, that's new. Yeah, that is new. We like this. It sounded like you wanted a more classic flavor. I did, but I do appreciate the flavor profile in here, and I know it's very popular. So, where, where do you want to go next? This one, which I also really enjoy. So, you're back and you're eight years old again. <laughs> I am. I agree with you on most things. I'm going to disagree with you here. These are too sweet. They are only 43% cacao, and I want more chocolate. Okay. You can have your sugar. Okay. I'm taking the chocolate. I like that. And these, which actually I, in my head, thought were the original. What are these? They're from a company called Guitard. Yeah. Uh, it was the runner-up. Again, a sort of high cacao. This was mm -hmm. our favorite of all the different Guitard products. And again, we thought just a lot of chocolate flavor and personality. All right, so there you have it. I guess I'm a classic girl, but if you want to buy the best chip on the market, reach for the Ghirardelli 60% premium baking chip at about $4.39 per bag. Not all liquids behave like this water, which pours exactly the same every single time. Some liquids change drastically depending on what we do to them. Go, Joe. Joe is running on top of a mixture of cornstarch and water. It's a liquid, but it acts like a solid when we apply force to it. If Joe stops moving, he'll sink right in. Stop, Joe. That is an example of a sheer thickening liquid because it gets thicker when we apply force to it. In the kitchen, we deal with lots of sheer thinning liquids, like these in front of me. I have mayonnaise, oyster sauce, mustard, hoisin, and ketchup. They go from a semi-solid to a liquid when we apply force. Well, let's check out this ketchup. When I turn the bottle upside down, nothing happens. When I tap on the side, it suddenly starts to flow. Because it changes based on outside force, you often end up with a lot more ketchup than you bargained for. So if you've ever struggled to get ketchup out of a glass bottle, remember to tap gently and just wait for it to thin. On the other hand, if you ever find yourself in a vat of cornstarch and water, keep running. I'm here in the test kitchen today with Sayla. She's nine years old, and we are testing oven mitts designed for kids. We decided to test oven mitts as opposed to pot holders because you really want the whole hand covered. We always recommend that a parent be standing by wearing their own oven mitts so that you can supervise to make sure that nobody gets burned. And first, we yeah. started out by saying, like, our grown-up oven mitt, would that work for kids? So why don't you try that on? How's it feel? Way too big. Way too big? Yeah, your hand is like lost in there. You can get it, but does that feel safe? No, I feel like I'm gonna drop it. Feel like you're gonna drop it. Yeah, that would not be good. So that's why we went and looked at ones that are scaled down for kids. Let's try some of these on. How about this guy? Okay, this is way too small. Way too small? Yeah, maybe for super tiny kids who are playing, but... It probably won't fit the size of someone who's like at the appropriate age for cooking. Totally agree. Too small, Yeah. right? Yeah, we found that too. Try this little guy with the polka dots. Too small. Too small. You want this? Yeah, I can't, I can't get it like right here, so I like to pick it up. Yeah, you can't like get your hand yeah. around. It's like you have no thumb, right? <laughs> we tried this one made from neoprene, which is what they use for wetsuits. It's really not flexible. I can't even pick it up. And then pulling yeah. it off, not so much fun either. So this one was kind of, eh, we don't like that one either. And this one, if you put yeah. that on, 
it comes up your arm a little bit, so this one gives you a little bit more protection than some of these other ones that are really short. It fits really well, yeah. Feel like you have a good grip on it? Yes. And how much fabric is there past your hands? Is it sticking out too much, or does it feel good? It feels good. This is our favorite for kids, and it's called the William Sonoma Junior Chef Oven Mint. It's $7.95 each. We recommend that you buy two of them so you have both hands covered. Most recipes for oven fries are downright terrible. They turn out a little something like this. They're mostly pale, except on the ends where they're incredibly tough and burned. They're very flabby. And on the inside, they're just really mealy and starchy. So today, we're gonna solve the oven fry problem once and for all, because Lon's here. And she cooked over 10 pounds of potatoes every day for over three weeks in order to get it just right. And by my estimation, that's a lot of potatoes. Sure is, and most of them, pretty bad. Oh, really? Oh, yes. But we're not going to do that today. We figured out how to make them taste great, have that perfect texture, and be nice and fluffy on the inside mm, as well. Tall order. Yes. We're going to start with the flavor. So the key to French fry flavor is to get the oil to oxidize slightly. That's what happens when you fry. Since we're not frying in the oven, we have to find a way around that. Mm -hmm. I'm starting with baking spray, and I'm just going to coat this pan generously. And then for the oil flavor, I have three tablespoons of vegetable oil. Okay, so baking spray, then vegetable oil is the key. Right. What we're doing here isn't just preventing the fries from sticking. The cooking spray is going to help the vegetable oil stay spread out across the surface of the pan, and that's how we ensure that every fry has just that right amount of flavor. Wow, because that's not a lot of oil. No, no. You see a lot of recipes that call for a third to a half a cup of oil, and you end up with kind of greasy fries, mm -hmm. and sometimes a smoking oven, and that was <laughs> not good. I've done that. So now I'm just tilting the pan to make sure it's evenly distributed. So the reason we coated that baking sheet with cooking spray before adding the vegetable oil is because it allows us to use less oil overall. Well, how does that work? Well, it comes down to the lecithin in the baking spray. See, lecithin is a special molecule. It has two sides, one side that's generally sticky and the other side that's attracted to oil. So when you spray it on the baking sheet, the sticky side sticks to the metal. The side that likes the oil is facing up. So when you pour the oil on top of it, it disperses evenly over the baking sheet, making a nice thin layer. So we can get away with using just three tablespoons. Well, that looks great. Okay, next up, the fries. I have Yukon Gold potatoes here, mm -hmm. and we're using Yukons because they have a nice thin skin and we don't have to peel them. So I'm just going to cut them first in half lengthwise. All right, so you went through the thin part of the potato. Yes, that just means we'll get more fries per potato. And I'm trimming a tiny sliver off the long side of each half. Instead of cutting the traditional wedge shape or even the matchstick, we're going to go with planks. That ensures two flat sides for nice browning and crispiness, and we don't have to flip them as often. Ah, very clever. That's it. This is two pounds of Yukon Golds. Okay. Next, if I were to take those potatoes and just dump them on this sheet pan, pop them in the oven, they're not going to crisp up. I've done that. It doesn't work. No. <laughs> <laughs> what we can do is put something on the outside that we know will crisp up, and that ingredient is cornstarch. I've got three tablespoons here, and instead of just sprinkling this on the potatoes, which will make the fries end up being a little dusty, we're going to mix it with some water, three quarters of a cup, but you can't put the potatoes in this either. No, that looks pretty watery. Yeah, nothing's going to stick. <laughs> what we're going to do is pop this in the microwave. That's going to cook the cornstarch just a little bit. We'll end up with something that's a little pudding-like, but it'll be thick enough to coat the planks really nicely. It's going to take anywhere between one to three minutes, and I'll be stirring every 20 seconds. So here we go. <laughs> it really transforms with those few minutes in the microwave. Yeah, so it's pretty warm, but not too thick, not too thin. If you do overdo it a little bit, you can just add a couple tablespoons of water, maybe a little at a time, whisk it in, thin it out slightly. It brings it right back. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So I'm just going to add these potatoes. <laughs> Plunk. Right. And I like to get in there with my hands. It's a little hard to get them to separate sometimes mm -hmm. if you're using a spatula. So what I'm looking for here is to make sure the potatoes are each lightly coated with this goo. <laughs> Once they are, we're going to transfer them to the baking sheet. So, Lon, i got to tell you, this looks really weird. Feels really weird, too. <laughs> and I got some weird looks in the kitchen when I was doing this, but it's totally worth it. All right. So these look great. <laughs> <laughs> they look right. I'm trusting you at this they, point. They look right. There's just a thin coating on here. Let's get them on the baking sheet. All right. 
I just want to make sure there's a tiny bit of space in between each plank so that they're not touching each other or getting glued to each other. Yeah, they're actually pretty well spread out on that baking sheet. Yeah, I found that if you crowd the baking sheet, they don't brown as quickly and it's not as satisfying. Okay, so one last thing to do. We're gonna cover these guys with aluminum foil. This has been grease. We're covering them so that they steam in the oven. That'll take about 12 minutes in a 425 degree oven, the very lowest rack of the oven. And then I'll remove that foil and let them brown on the first side and that'll take anywhere between 10 to 18 minutes. Ooh, they smell like fries. They look like fries or they will when I flip them. <laughs> right, the cornstarch coating has mostly disappeared, which is great. And I'm just gonna flip these over. Hoo -hoo -hoo. I was not expecting them to look like that when she flipped them over. And all of that with just three tablespoons of oil. That's a real feat. Yes, this looks great. This is ideal. The center ones are usually less brown. They'll darken a tiny bit in the oven as they continue to brown. All right, back in the oven they go? Yes, they're gonna go in for another 10 to 18 minutes to brown that second side and we're using the very lowest rack of the oven because then the fries are right up against the heating element. Makes sense. My goodness. That is quite a transformation. Right, don't they smell great? They smell amazing. It went from really weird looking to really amazing looking. You wouldn't know they had looked weird earlier, right? <laughs> so first things first, we're gonna season them. Just like with all fries, you wanna get the salt on while the potatoes are hot. I've got a half a teaspoon of table salt here, and it might sound like a lot, but you'll notice a ton of this is sticking to the pan, so don't worry. I'm just gonna give them a quick toss. One of the things that makes French fries taste like fries is that salt, and we wanna make sure it's getting on early enough that it sticks. Boy, those fries really make a sound on that baking sheet. They sound crisp. They are. These are the most beautiful oven fries I've ever seen. Oh, thanks. So let's get these off. We wanna make sure they're blotted so they're not greasy. I'm just gonna give them a quick little tap. And get rid of this paper. So, you ready for fries? <laughs> Am I ready for fries? I see you have some ketchup here. Oh, I am all about the condiments. Oh, are you? <laughs> yeah, for sure. Mmm. It has such a crisp exterior. Tastes mm. like fries, right? It tastes like a fry. You can see that nice creamy interior. That's hard to get on any fry, much less an oven fry. I mean, look at this. That's a gorgeous fry, no matter what kind of fry it is, much less that it came out of an oven with only three tablespoons of oil. Lon, these are oven fry perfection. So if you wanna make the ultimate oven fries, start with a rimmed baking sheet and spray it with cooking spray, then vegetable oil. Cut Yukon gold potatoes into evenly thick planks and make a cornstarch slurry by cooking water and cornstarch together in the microwave. After tossing the fries with the slurry and arranging them on the baking sheet, roast them on the lowest rack of a 425 degree oven, covering them with foil at the beginning and flipping them over partway through cooking. And don't forget to season them with salt while they're still hot. From America's Test Kitchen to your kitchen, killer recipe for thick cut oven fries. You can get this recipe and all the recipes from this season, along with our tastings, testings, and selected episodes at our website, americastestkitchen.com. How many people does this serve? Two, two apparently. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for watching America's Test Kitchen. What'd you think? Well, leave a comment and let us know which recipes you're excited to make, or you can just say hello. You can find links to today's recipes and reviews in the video description. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel. See you later. I'll see you later.